David King, welcome. G'day, G. No, we can't make sense of all of that. How Seven do, games gave us more than nine normally does. <laughs> I was good on it. It was a terrific oh, it was weekend. So good. It's so uh, There's so much to talk about. I don't know where to start, really. but um, The King's Gambit. So our mighty steed has been retired to stud. They sent caps for us to remember who him by. Who is it? King's Gambit. He's gone. Yep. He's gone to stud. He's gone to stud. That's not a bad uh, way to go. He never quite was a horse that we wanted him to be on the track, don't placing mind. in a golden slipper. I don't mind the new move, though. But, uh, is that mine, is it? Yeah, that's for you. Fair Golf thing. cap. It's the first thing you've given me in 10 years. It's, it's, oh, I got it for free, so I just <laughs> want to declare that. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> well, this, I'm only passing it on. <laughs> that doesn't count. <laughs> the King's Gambit for Victoria Police, oh. made for more search police uh, careers. Frightening how tight you are. Frightening. <laughs> <laughs> My God. What's your opening proposition? Well, how long do you chase the mirage? Like, I'm, I'm looking at the Melbourne Football Club and I'm saying, what, what, what's happened here? They were so good at what they were for five years and they had this this contested possession game that no one could compete with. The best ruck in the competition, wherever it went, he'd beat you. The ball would hit the deck, you got Oliver going 100 miles now. If it wasn't him, it was Viney, who's, who's the toughest head in the competition. If it wasn't him, it was Petrarca with a bit of brilliance, whether it was forward or, or in the midfield. Knocked the ball down in their defence and it was Stephen May and Lever and all these guys and you just couldn't beat them. If it was in a contest, you were gone. You'd win one in every three. But they wanted to be something else you know, because it's run, it runs aground in, in, in finals. We haven't quite had the, the scoring uh, flow that we wanted. We haven't had this let's change everything to make that forward line work. Well, they've given up what their absolute strength on the competition was and their aura is gone. They're no longer the brutal uh, beasts that they were. It, it has dissipated to a point now where you've got hard – Guild edge players trying to play the beautiful game, and it's failing them, and and they've lost their invincibility now. We we ticked off the West Coast one as a mulligan. Yep, Eagles on their day, great performance, hard to travel and win. We made excuses for them, but right now, the second mulligan is a cry for help. This is this is not working. You know, things are failing. How how can we address these things? I, I look at that game yesterday, and, and you can go you can go wherever you want with it, right? And we'll get to the Fremantle side of it later because that, they deserve credit for putting a club into a flat spin like yes. this. Yes, so that, that's that's a great asset. In the in the forward half of the ground, so to 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 score, you have to win a contest in your forward half. It's very rare you go uncontested all the way down the ground. It just doesn't happen, right? Or it happens once in every blue moon. They were minus 35 for winning contests in their forward half. So the Frio defensive end versus the Melbourne forward end, minus 35. Now, you're not, you're not necessarily going to win that stat, but if as close to break even as you can get is, is uh, advantageous. Minus 35 is their worst result. For, I've gone back five years, and, it's, it's, and I can't go back any further. I ran out of time. Yep, yep. But for, for five years, that's their worst result. Yep. They, are, they were uncompetitive centre forward. That, that, that's not them. Now they've never been; they're not a gifted uh, uh, talent-wise in, in their forward half, and they've tried to find: is the answer Petty? Is the answer Brown? Is the answer this? Is, and they've always had that problem. That's just been one problem. Now they've spread that problem to: uh, now we've got to move the ball, we've got to shift it off the line. So they've lost their total contest game. The game doesn't live where they needed to live. They've allowed the game to get out of the trenches where they were strong, and now they're playing everyone else's game. Well, the reason they won a premiership and the reason they were a top four team for so long is because you had to play Mel. They dragged you into the battle. And when just when you thought you're out, they drag you back in again. They're chasing this mirage of being the beautiful ball movement team, and it ain't them. So I, I don't know where to from here because the logic is everywhere. The, the, the Fremantle were able to just chip the ball around down back. There was no plan to stop them you know, moving that ball lateral and getting to the other side and going. So Melbourne couldn't stop that. So once you engage in the beautiful game, you've got to be able to take things off the opposition. And if you can't do that and you allow the game out of the trenches, who's going to win the game back for them? Who, who's going to get it done? So all their problems come home to roost. And we talked about this a month ago saying, okay, how long can you go with this plan to you say, nah, it's not working. We have to go back to where we're strong and who we are. And, and it's going to rely on their on their top liners again. I mean, Gorn, Gorn Oliver, Petrarca and Viney are it. And, and all roads lead to next Monday. And, and they're going to get a Collingwood that are they're down on talent. Um, but I'm telling you now, we've got Father Joe Jacoby on standby to read the last rights to Melbourne next Monday. Okay. 
Is because if they yeah. don't get this one done against the banged up Collingwood, then 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 this is it. The, the premiership run will be over. This is how big the next couple of weeks are for Melbourne, because they're not they're not playing to to the core of who they are. They, they've there's been an identity theft at Melbourne. Yeah, you know, their 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 DNA is just in your face, hard. Let's dance, and that wins your finals. And I know it, it cost them last year, and you can make you can go you can go too far with your review of getting everything right. Sometimes you've got to you got to understand you're vulnerable somewhere. And even though you, even though Collingwood won a flag last year, they were still vulnerable in in areas. Yep, they try and work on them, but don't give up everything you're good at to 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 try and correct that. So that that for me um, is the biggest question in footy right now. And Simon Goodwin has to have a powwow with the key leaders, the coaching staff, and say how long do we want to chase this mirage? So a couple of the commonalities, so not one-off weirdness, is twice in three weeks they're conceding 100 points. So 132 contested marks, uncontested marks yesterday conceded 96 against West Coast. And just the staggering lack of inside 50s, only 36 in the West Coast game and 37 here. And then, yeah, as there were so many numbers for you, you drown in those numbers yeah. out of yesterday. Every layer. But the numbers, them. ultimately all the numbers have a starting point. And the starting points at contests, so you can you can spend all day putting fingers in in holes to try and stop the the flow of blood, but but you can't until you can win contest. So they've lost that. Getting that back, you know, is that a is that a five minute fix? I, I don't know. I, the simple answer is I don't know. But you've got to recognise that this is the problem. That you've changed. You've gone too far with change. And you've become un an uncontested players when you're not that you're not that sort of player. I, I'm happy to engage in the uncontested game against uh, Clayton Oliver and uh, and and Jack Viney, but drop a ball in between, you know, a meter from you and them, and you're not winning it. I don't care who you are. Well, the, the history tells us that. So how would you rather play Melbourne? You'd rather play them in the uncontested game. So don't do what the opposition wants. Um, anyway, it, it's a, it's a deeper discussion, but all those numbers. The root cause of all of those numbers is the fact they couldn't win contests. We've never said that. So it, it's more than a, it's more than a challenge. This this is this is, in my opinion, if they don't make change, it's over. The premiership run is over without change. The King's Gambit for Victoria Police looking for a career that gives you more. Search Police Careers Victoria Police made for more, and that makes Fremantle. The big issue is out of last Friday night's game was the question, did they unlock some possibilities in the 25-point flurry? They had a chance to win that game late and didn't. <laughs> of all the possibilities yesterday, putting 22 goals past Melbourne. So this is this was a different Fremantle. Yeah, so they, they, engaged, in, they engaged in Fremantle's game. Now, I'm, I'm going to give Fremantle massive credit. Because everything, everything that they did, again, is the flip side of what we're talking about with Melbourne. It, it started at contest. So we've always talked about their back line being able to win the ball back and being, I think, um, I think Justin had to trust them more, play with more freedom. And if the ball comes back at speed, just say, hey, we've got, we've got some good players behind the ball. They'll, they'll win it back for us. And Ryan and Pierce and, and those, uh, the, the, the flanker types, we'll, we'll be fine. So I want them to play with real aggression. This has been my whole discussion. Play with freedom, and if they get through every now and then, and you concede eleven goals instead of seven, does it really matter? Because you'll kick four or five more going the other way. You've got a seriously stacked team. But I look forward of the ball, and this is where the growth in in Tracy and, and, and Amos has been significant this year. And everyone keeps telling me, oh, they're in for they're in for Logan McDonald, they're in for all these other. What they've got's pretty good. It just, I'd be trusting those guys. I wouldn't be making too much change there at the end of the year. But let's talk about today. Um, and I had a look. So you've got to you've you've got to take things off Fremantle if you play them, right? So if you if you want to let them, if they take less than um, fifty five uh, marks in the back half of the field, they're, they're three losses and one win. And and the one win was against a banged up St Kilda who who, who really didn't compete. Um, so. So Melbourne didn't take that off them. They allowed them easy outs and easy ball movement down the other end of the ground, out the other side. So that that's you've got to tick that off as that's that's Fremantle's tactic. That's the way they want to play: ball controlled, 
in hand. So not in the not in the frantic game. The frantic game's around clearance. So the, the clearance numbers, I put them up last night. So the, the plus 24 clearance is the best they've done for at least 10 years. And it's probably closer to 15 years, but at least 10 years. Scores from clearance, plus 48 points, is their best return since round 20, 2013. 2013. There's been a lot of games between 2013 and yes, now, Jerry, for the Fremantle Footy Club. You're probably 250 games. So it's a, it's an outlier performance that'll have us making you know grandiose statements, but it's such an outlier it probably does need an asterisk because there's two parties in this. You know, it's the Fremantle, the Fremantle brilliance, and and what did they play against? So. Love what they've done. They get a real fill up. They get a, they get a great um, a great reward um, for their efforts, and nothing like a scoreboard reward to do that. What what was the score in the end? It was twenty two yeah, goals. Twenty two nine. Twenty two goals. I mean that that's fantastic. So they've had a complete fill up, um, and it and it shows you that if you allow Freo to play their game, they can do this to you. Now that's a huge tick. We haven't really said that about Fremantle offensively before, but I, I'm more at the contest, and and I. I'm different to to Kane. Kane Kane doesn't believe in the two rucks. I think Darcy, the big bodied ruckman against Max Gorn's perfect, um, and then Jackson comes in and does does the rest. So the scoring, for, I'm I'm fascinated by the scoring gaps between when one ruckman is in the ruck versus when the other is in the ruck. So that when you've got the the twin twin peaks, if you like. So Darcy Darcy versus Gorn was responsible for four goals too. And Jackson versus Gorn was responsible for one goal, so so you've you've got to say the absolute ruckman, the structural ruckman, in the big body Darcy, had more of a say in their clearance dominance than what than what Jackson did. So I know Jackson's a better product, and it says, oh, but he didn't get as much opportunity. It was forty two contests versus thirty one, so it's not a massive discrepancy. It's not like sixty to twenty. Um, so I, th- I think they endorsed the two ruckmen yesterday. So th- there's little bits of growth for Fremantle that they'll be able to take uh, forward with them. But in the end, the fill up of 22 goals it gives the coach so much scope to to preach to this group. Yes. Yeah, so that that's what I. If you smooth off the outlier aspect to it, and then you go, can they harness? So they, they've got some validation now on yes, still control the ball down. But if they play with a little bit more adventure, and Dare they, they? They've got some pretty good evidence in front of them now that, that they are capable, yeah, and that it could really serve them well. And that's all I've been saying. Like Fremantle fans, they want to be outraged because they think you haven't go at their club. I'm not having a go at all. I think they can play so much more aggressive football. The the uncontested mark game to me, it's almost a measure of when you've lost momentum to go into the uncontested mark game. They they don't have, they haven't lost momentum in most of their games to then drop into that that mode. And it's a safe mode, and maybe it, maybe that mode we, we we're still all adjusting to this the new rule changes. Maybe that mode is the way to go, rather than risk the the, the holding the ball opportunities or the the absolute panic to get rid of the ball, the th- the thirst for speed now to not get nabbed um, by the new new amendments. So it's it's very difficult to assume, but I would love to see them just take the restrictors off and find out are they are they so gifted in the middle and so creative with this handball game that they can get to 20 goals more often than not. Went to the game in Alice Springs yesterday. Frio was awesome. Dees didn't show up. Great setting, good size ground, and in great nick. Very little atmosphere compared to a stadium. That is from Charlie. Melbourne have a wasted have wasted a premiership list. It will be hard to go out in straight sets when you don't even make the finals. That's Sammy from Norlane. Scott in Perth, I'm a Dockers member for the last 28 years. I agree with you, Kingy. They look so good when they play the attacking style of footy and you win more when you attack because best form of defence is attack. And despondent D, James, thank God for Kung Fu Panda. He resorted to Kung Fu Panda as that game was unfolding yesterday. Kung Fu Panda. (laughs) Okay. um, The Twilight game was just a great watch, Gold Coast and Essendon. I thought we might put the open question over the Gold Coast Sun. So they're seven and five. They're unbeaten on the Gold Coast and in Darwin. They have home games to come against Collingwood, Port Adelaide, Brisbane, and Melbourne. And then their away games are St Kilda, Fremantle, North Melbourne, the Giants, West Coast, Essendon, and Richmond. They probably need to pinch two on the road, maybe three, just to ensure against an upset at home. 
and they'd see finals for the first time. It's, what might they be is our open question on the Suns, King. Well, Horny and I track the, the profiles, the core four. So you got, you've got to see where they've come from to see where they are. Like, you know, last year's profile is the reason why they had to make change. In the end, you could, they couldn't roll along with the same sorts of numbers, the same sorts of evidence uh, under Stuart Jew, unfortunately. I, and I really enjoyed his time up there, and I think that the club got a lot of growth and, and become a football club with Stuart there. Now we're seeing it go to the next level. We're seeing the, the full buying stuff. So last year, you know, with and without the footy, they were, they were ranked 13th, so in the bottom, bottom half a dozen teams of the comp. And, and they didn't really have a, a set method of beating teams. There's no way that, you know, one way that if the game entered this phase that, that you were in trouble. It, it wasn't that type of um, that type of build. So I, I look at the last six weeks of what they've become. So right now, th those 13th and 13th numbers are now 6th and 3rd and 10th, and, and, and uh, so ninth. sorry, at the post-clearance game, the post-clearance contest game. So when the ball's in general play, being able to win the ball back or – Continue your possession chain by winning contest on the. There's a lot of method in that. There's a lot of coaching in that. How do you get your out number? Where does it come from? So that that takes a while to embed, but it's happened quick, because with elite level talent, they can grasp footy knowledge in a shorter space of time. So if you're working with with Brumbies, it'll take a long time. But if you're working with the, the star factor players, it can happen quite quick. That's why I keep saying when it turns, it'll turn big and really quick. So we compared it last night to when Lee Matthews went to Brisbane in 1999. They had this these younger guys like Black and Power were 19, Nigel Lappin and Chris Johnson Acker and the Scott Twins were all 22. But they they were high end footy intelligence, so they already had the Vosses and and those guys. The, the, the Alistair Lynches were there and the Lepiches were there, so they already had those guys. And these younger guys were able to come in and pick up things really quick. And really charged. So they win 16 games in Lee's first year, make a prelim. Then they go backwards slightly the next year out at the semi final stage. And then the next year they win a flag. So in a space of 60 games, they're winning a flag. This is what's going to happen here. So you get, when you see the shift in the way they play, like they won the game yesterday on ball movement, it, it, the ball was just tracking up and down the ground. And, and, you, and you could see. Essendon were happy to engage in that sort of game. So last week we talked about Essendon winning the ball back at halfback and Ridley being that dominant presence there. Well, they got beaten in the, the halfback bounce game, right? Yep. yep. Which, is, which is an indicator for premiership success. The teams that score efficiently from halfback, that from the centre circle to the top of the opposition forward 50, is the defensive midfield it's called, but I just call it halfback. So yesterday it was, <clears throat> it was eight scores to four in favour of the Suns. Now, that's a big margin. And to only concede four shows that you're, you're good enough once you've lost that ball from a Suns point of view to, to hold up. Mac Andrews, a phenom. What he's doing, <clears throat> excuse me, at his age is ridiculous and he's only going to get better because he's he's such a um, – he's, he's like David Rhys Jones for the older market out there. He's so, so casual – yet perfect. Like he's in the right spot at the right time. He's never flustered with the ball. He makes some errors. You've got to wear a couple a game. But he, he's, his ability to be in the right spot and to be able to defend and defuse any problem coming in is uh, not too big for him. So he's been a revelation. So what that allows in terms of the players around, I can't wait for Powell to come back um, because he's a serious player as an intercept halfbacker. Do they get Dan Real at the end of the year? Do they get someone else? Do they get two? I mean, they've got, they got significant draft selects. They've got, they got picks 4, 10, 20, and 24 to trade with because of the way they've swapped picks over the last couple of years to get points. Um, so there's a real opportunity there to turn to convert that into known products that maybe at the club they're at are not A-graders, but throw them in here and they don't have to be A-graders. They just have to be good B-grade players. So that's where I think Damien's taken this team really quickly. I thought the significant aspect, so – in Darwin, midfield has its way with Geelong. Career best nights for everyone. They wilt in the face of the Crips challenge in Melbourne. And you go, okay, so what's it going to be against a midfield that, that's going really well? And game on the line twice, Essendon draw level twice, midfield gets it done. Raul, Anderson, yeah. tick, tick. 
Well, there's there's moments in games where you just have to have it. And we, we talk about, you know, it's usually a centre bounce clearance. When, when a game sharpens and gets to that crescendo of shit, it's on the line here. Who's going to stand up? And you need it to be your best players because if it's not Raoul, well, it doesn't feel the same. But when he goes in there, rips the ball, ducks his head under a tackle and takes one step out, pops the handball, you go, wow. Yeah, the whole team lift. You, you can sort of feel the, oh, geez, that's good. You know, oh, we're, we're on here. We're, and the forwards light up there. You can see their eyes widen and away they go. You know, and, and that, that to me, there's, there's more, it's more than just a, a clearance. It's, it's an attitude, it's, a, it's an investment in we have to have this, you hit the ball near me. Like we've talked about Pendlebury and Dacos in that last centre bounce of the grand final. Hey, you don't want to be part of this. Get in here, this is going to be spe- – so that's a sort of – that's what we're talking about. It's, it's not necessarily about the one clearance. It's game on the line. If they win it, we're in trouble. Hit it to me. So I, I loved it. Okay, so they go forward, kick the goal, they're a goal up again. Ball goes back in the middle. Essendon win it. Bobbles around. Blah blah blah. They 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 level it up again. You go. Well, here we go again. Yeah. And then it's Anderson with a bit of brilliance. And yet that's that's the ace and king in there. That's their best two, separating the game. So there's a lot to love about about what they're doing, um, and their profile is is shifting before our eyes. And and I understand that. You know, the Suns don't have a massive fan base in Melbourne, but this is this is going to be the perfect time to be great. New team coming in, you get all sorts of tradable uh, assets in terms of picks and those sort of things, which is what happened with the Brian Lake and the Josh Gibson and the David Hale acquisitions at Hawthorne way back when, when the draft was compromised. This is going to be a great time to be great. Anything on Essendon out of that? Didn't lose any of Myers. No, I felt the same way. Yeah. That sometimes the price of doing business is you lose a game. But they did some good business. And I don't know how much you believe about how crook they were during the week, but let's just give it some credibility and say, okay, that they were banged up and had a had a, a disjointed week and then travel on top and then a good side on the road that, that have, are undefeated at home now. Yep. So I don't think they lose any admirers and and they've taken such great strides this year, it's hard to be critical of Essendon. What category should we put Hawthorne in? Ooh, wherever you want. Yeah. Let's just talk about them. They're a bit of a wild, they're wild card in every way. So I thought we'd just give them the wild card category. Right, eh? They're in such, they're so good to watch as a starting point. And then you talk about a team who's has the capacity to leave a bit of trauma in their wake. They're leaving trauma yeah. in their wake through these handful of games. They're taking good scalps. Uh, and I, I'm happy to have Adelaide in the pressure index there and we'll deal with them in a minute. But just what Hawthorne has revealed in themselves, a frustrating start to the season where they're grasping to pick up where they left off and they don't. And then to their credit, they balance up and they're exactly the team that they um, would have hoped to grow into right now. It's, it's funny, you know, because every time I watch a Hawthorne game, I just see numbers. I just see numbers of Hawthorne players in the screen. And, and you, just, you can pause it yourself at home. With the camera angle on, and just close your eyes and go, "Yep, now pausing, right <laughs> on your KO box." And you, and when it pauses, it is always an outnumber in favour of Hawthorne. I still think they got they got a lot of work to do. It's it's going to sound negative, and I don't mean it to be, but in the areas that matter, there's still significant scope for improvement. Their ball movement's not as good as what we think it is, because when it when it works, it looks amazing. But there's a lot of, there's a lot that's clunky and then, and then it's not working. So there's massive scope for growth there. Um, without the footy, there's still there's still there's still some problems down back. And I know their fullbacks was injured early in the season, so they've had to cobble uh, together a back six more often than not. I love the fact that uh, Josh Weddle's been able to play almost centre half back or as centre half back the last few weeks. But I just think against the better teams, you're going to need a bigger body than that and, and someone. You know, bit more bulletproof than that. So that I think to, to take the next big step, they're going to still need some talent, some tall talent. Lewis is a big absence up forward. I, I understand that. But I, I still think he, he's coaching his socks off, Sam, at the moment with his with his ability to get the out number. But that's their major advantage. Not not a lot else. I'm not, I'm not trying to be negative. I'm just sort of saying – this is what it is, and it's and it's you can tell there's a buy in there from the players. They love him. So what they were able to do defensively was the thing that really, 
that really pleased me in the middle of the ground. Not, not If the ball gets down back, they're in trouble still. Um, but they were able to turn the game around. So Crows trying to bring the ball out of their back half, couldn't get it out. First half, they got they had 40 chances for one point. Well, they just couldn't move it. And when they gave it back, it was a record high. Um, for the Hawks, the cost on turnover was 46 points from those intercepts between the arcs. The Adelaide's, Adelaide normally don't give you that. They normally give you about half of that. So that that's a that's a big win. If you can, as you say, leave a club in trauma by taking away their game totally and making them look second rate. As soon as you take away their game, there is no plan B. Don't 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 give me plan Bs. I don't want to hear about plan Bs, right? There is no plan B. If you beat plan A, that's it. Um if plan B was any good, it'd be plan A, Jerry. <laughs> so that that's that's a great effort from Hawthorne to be able to play that way and, and be so good between the arcs. Dylan Moore, gee, isn't he in some form? Um, yeah, he's look, he's he's a he's a top liner, Jared, really, and he's playing. He's he's played in roles that are low disposal, high damage, and it's hard to be a high damage player regularly. Um, but more, more responsibility, yeah, you know, more more opportunity has seen him become a better player further up the field. Um, those players, I, I love those players. I, I like guys that can be best on ground with twelve touches. Mm. And if you get to, if you can get them to twenty touches, terrific. If you can find a way to get them to twenty-five, like we're seeing Cozzy Pickett. Now it's not always working, but Cozzy Pickett going in for centre bounces, but nominally playing as a half forward. They're the sort of damage players that I love. So the more opportunity you can give to Dylan Moore to get the ball in his hands, the better they will be as a product. He's having a great year. They've just been passed by Hawthorne. They're 14th. They've got four wins to their name. They get overs, Adelaide. They get overs. Yeah. Yeah, I, I can understand that that opinion. Um, oh, I just think if you take your magic out of your team, this is what you get. The magic man covers over so many things, Jared. Isaac Rankin is, is a phenomenal talent and he creates scores. So when you rip that out for a couple of weeks – and Taylor Walker has a back spasm or a back issue again, and you take him out, who's they've been their most productive forward for the last five years, and then you have a, a fitness test for Jordan Dawson before the game. He's clearly not right. I don't care what level of not right he is. He's nowhere near 100%. So there's your ace, king, queen. Two of them, you know, one of them not there, one of them subbed out, and one of them clearly impacted. Then, then this is what you get. Now, I understand people come at me hard because they think I protect Matthew Nix. I don't protect him at all. This this is you take Heaney, Warner and, and and give me an impacted Golden out there, and I guarantee you you'll get this sort of performance from Sydney. So Adelaide are not immune to to these sorts of problems. Um, I thought they play with a, a real safety. They put the safety switch on on the weekend. It was it was dull. It's not them. They they need to play with a bit of freedom, run and gun and handball and create and get through corridor and they for whatever reason just didn't, and and I think he found it hard to explain why they didn't. And in our game, you 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 send them out there and you see them thirty minutes later. It's it's really hard to adjust. The game was over by the time he got to talk to them again. Yep. So that that's great from a Hawthorne point of view, and Adelaide have got to be better at that. These younger players in the midfield have got to be better than this. So not all not all lessons um, come with this sort of trauma, but it's it's a it's an obvious lesson for them to learn. If you're not going to be true to yourself, you can't win. The Plan B discussion. This is our plan, and it is our only plan. Let's go with it. We can do stuff at stoppages and all that sort of stuff, but uh, I, I still I still endorse his coaching. I see what he's doing. Okay, you're going to have some bumps, but they've they've come from a long way back um, over the last few years. I'm not here. To, I'm not here to endorse Matty Nix, but what we saw, what we saw on the weekend, was pretty poor. Um, and if that remains, well, then he'll be in the hot seat. There's no doubting that. But when the magic man comes back, Jared, it'll it'll look a lot uh, more aggressive than what it does right now. Yeah, they're a long way back from the team that they aspired to be this year. But the worst bit was the Mike Kelty Lafau injury, as we had a, a great snap judgment on that. This was one of the stories of the year building. It adds to the malaise around Richmond. It was just such a pity late in the game. And, you know, for what that young story is, it goes on pause for 12 months. A terrible pity. There are some injuries when they happen. Do you find yourself, I don't know whether you live it and, and breathe it like we all do. I know you love you love watching it and love your footy. But do you find yourself sitting on the couch and when he you see his knee hyperextend, you sort of touch your own knee and go, oh, <laughs> oh that's got to hurt. You sort of feel it. That was one of those ones that 
everyone felt. And then when the, his pain subsided and he was walking off, I thought, oh, no, not, not, please don't be, you know, because that's, that's the classic ACL, the pain at the start and then it subsides. You're right, he's been a great story. I just, I just feel for Adam Uze. Like, he's just not even getting a chance. He's really not getting a chance to apply any of his tactical uh, advantage or nous on the, against the competition, and, and all he has is pressure. Because really, that's all he can teach these young players at the moment. And he just hopes that some of the senior players get a hold of a game. They could have been six, seven goals in front at one stage and, and really shook the foundations of Geelong. They just couldn't quite finish their work. Um, so I think we've – it's just going to be a tough initiation now. What's that, eight, that's eight knee injuries at, at uh, Richmond? Gee, that's a lot. That's a lot of knees. Yeah, and half of them ACLs. Yeah. Yeah, so that they, they can't take a trick no. uh, and it, it distills in that. Should Ferris be part of the Rising Star Award? So it's the worst kind of reactionary stuff is going, we should change it. Is you, you can't do that. We have to acknowledge that we've had the ruination of the award because there's only two contenders and they both got suspended on the same weekend. That is shockingly bad luck. 1993, when this is instituted, I'm so interested why it was chosen that fairest would be part of it. It doesn't mirror the Brownlow. It's not a week-by-week week voting award. It's a subjective vote by the All-Australian judges at the end. The very next year, Corey McKernan misses on the, the fleeting and marginal suspension of tripping. And yet we didn't clearly debate that firmly enough at the time and go, hey, what, what, why would this be? We're, we're trying to acknowledge the best young player in the game and maybe a little bit of forecasting for the future. Neither incident on the weekend involving Darcy and Reed ruins their character or their reputation, their bad moments on a football field, and you get two weeks for them. It just it, it strikes me as just being out of whack. I understand why the Brownlow is fairest and best. It dates back to a time, and the tradition has continued. This doesn't date back to a time. This starts in 1993. Well, we have to say that Corey McKernan was proven to be a dirty player <laughs> because he was rubbed out of the Brownlow as well, Jared, that he won in 96. So that was proven to be correct. Hello, Corey. Good afternoon, Corey. <laughs> um, I think what you end up doing is creating the Rising Star Butt Award. He's the Rising Star Butt. Harley Reid was really the Rising Star. He's the Rising Star Butt. Corey McKernan was really the – that doesn't happen with the Brownlow because because the the that's always been the school of thought. You are the Brownlow medalist. And we would very rarely say, oh, but with the Brownlow. So I think we've just created – we just create a longer conversation now we're not having the best two youngsters eligible. It'll be a, it'll, it's a definite but. Whoever's a rising star will, will be the, the fakest and falsest rising star we've had for a while because we're already down the depth chart. And it's one of the purest and most beautiful moments of the season when you live through all of their stories at the ceremony and then named. It, it's got such an uplifting quality to it. And unfortunately, that just won't, it, it's going to have a connotation to it this year. So that's just how it is. We, we just leave it? No, no. I think we should, at the end of the year, have the conversation that should have been had in 1994. It just doesn't make sense to me why Ferris is part of it. So you change it into this year, and what do you do? Do you hand out retrospectives? So that, that's, a, that's for other minds to no, grapple I'm with. I'm asking your mind. Uh, no, because uh, now I need to understand exactly how the voting works on these things, is if you... Do you get votes and they're yep. excluded or yep. do you not get votes? You get votes. Okay. So I was just having a look at, is Dustin Martin was ineligible in 2010. He doesn't get votes, but I haven't had time ah. to go back and look at how that worked. So, yeah, I, I, I'm i just so interested as why the architects of the time with the new award decided that this had to be part of it. I want you to find out who they were, Jared. I want you to name them during the <laughs> week, please. No, you're, you're spot on. I think everyone wants the best young kid to win it. And I don't care if they've been suspended. More often than not, it's, they're in football acts. They're not, they're not dirty acts. They're not outside of our code. They're a football act gone wrong, a sling tackle, a trip. I mean, they're things that, you know, even Sam Darcy, whilst it's on the edge of, you know, rough play, it's still a football act. It's still the game, our great game. Um, let's just vote the best kids. Yeah, so I have no issue with Ferris as being part of the Brownlow. I, I don't indulge in that debate. I'm happy to listen to people say it. I, I, I think there's a there's a way you could readdress that, but not remove it. Ferris has always been part of the Brownlow. 
but I just don't quite understand. I've never been at the Rising Star ceremony where it's made of virtue as this is for the fairest and best young player, but it always is at the Brownlow and always has been for as long as I can remember. Yeah. So we've always held that up, but I just, I'm just not quite sure I understand why it applies in the Rising Star. And it's a subjective vote. It would be as silly as saying to the All-Australian selectors, or by the way, you can't have any All-Australian players who have been suspended. Well, why? It doesn't make any sense. Mm. I just don't think it should apply. Yeah. And I'm not here. I, I want to be really clearly understood. This is a debate that should have been had 30 years ago. Yeah. And the, the text come in that it's disrespectful to say that, you know, focus and falsus. But I think when you're already at number three and we're still got half the season to go, who's to say number three and four don't get suspended? What, we give the fifth best junior the rising star? I think that's reality. If we're not going to give it to the best, we, we, it's clearly a fake award. If the best doesn't get it, then then it becomes a nonsense. Odd one, an odd one. The debate for New Vision Clinic's Keyhole Just Laser Vision Next Generation it. Technology, call 1-800-2020. Could you change it now? No. Nope. Why not? You can't enter the season uh, under the premise and then change it halfway through because it doesn't suit us. It doesn't well, suit we, us, though. It doesn't suit us, yeah. and it is the ruination of this year's award because the two contenders are ineligible, okay. but you can't change it midway right through. Should have, whoever was the, on the beat in 1994 should Name have them. changed. Name them, well, Jared. I want to know what Mike Sheen wrote at the time. Mike, did you did you petition we against Mike? this? Are we blaming Mike. He's the only one who could have got it done. Patrick Smith, Caro was Jeez. on the beat. Who didn't get it changed back in 1994? <laughs> I'm ringing Mike. Corey. I'm telling you you've done that. <laughs> uh, right. <laughs> What else? Where else do I? Oh, I want to do holding the ball. Um, yeah, let's let's do that here before we take our next break. Did you like it? I, I thought it was excellent. So what they got right is this change mid-year. Didn't need a rule change. Just a slight change in interpretation. So the sum total of it all is I don't think it's represented in the numbers, but for we were having eight holding the balls a game. We went to 11, and that was because reasonable time went from half in a game to three. So it, was, it sort of directly correlates. But... It, the, the view of it was much more interesting is holding the ball serves the game so well. It's always been a necessary part of the game. We haven't been, been vigilant with it and the game is better when it's paid. And the more I saw on the weekend, the more I absolutely believe it. Yeah. We, we've had this discussion on crunch time a month ago and, and I said, you've got to go from five beats to three beats. They've done that perfectly, absolutely perfectly. And I love the quick whistle when they can see the ball's not moving so it saves the slam tackle or the, or the extra effort to get the bigger, the larger players to ground, which can go horribly wrong, and, and then we're getting head trauma. So that's a that's a big saving. Well done for that, for the safety of the, of the code. And I love the fact we're challenging players to dispose of the ball quicker. So it frees up. The ball is getting into space faster on the weekend than what it had because players panic. I don't want to be caught with the ball here, down back. I have to get it out. That will improve scoring. Yeah, so it will have a flow and effect. The only rider that, that I will put on it is that we're going to get games that are going to have 20 holding the balls in them. Uh, and are we comfortable with that? Because right now, the game in Geelong on the weekend had 16, which is a lot, given that the, av the average was eight. So eight to, to 16 is a big jump. Are we comfortable that we will have probably one game a weekend have 16 or 18 plus on any given game? Round. So we were still getting that outlier. The, the Collingwood Brisbane game at the Gab early in the year had seventeen yep. under the under the interpretations at the time. So we will still get the outlier game. So, so the game in the West, it felt like the umpires didn't get the memo no. versus. So so there will be there was already discrepancy, and there will be discrepancy. So that seventeen game might be a twenty five game. Are you happy it, with that? It could be. Um, if they're there, I am. Yeah. So every now and then you get an outlier. And I remember there was one, it was an MCG game that Hawthorne were part of a couple of years ago and it had a high number. It was too many as it turned out if you broke them down, but the answer was somewhere in the middle. I think we've sort of moved towards the middle. Does, does it, do you think it makes it easier for the umpire or harder? That's actually a really good question. I suspect it makes it easier. So it feels a bit to me like if it looks like holding the ball, it's probably holding the ball. Whereas we were trying to go, oh, does it meet this? Does it meet does it this layer here? This? I would be happy to get to the point of going. It the one that I like love, the Jerry, yeah. the one that I love is where players have been tackled by one arm and, and probably the body and they're just cuddling and cradling it under yep. one wing. That's now getting called. Yep. It won't take long for players to catch on to that 
And, and if we pay that 10 times a game, I'm thrilled with that because right. that's killing our game. So let's revisit a little bit of our crunch time discussion, shall we, and put Carlton in PFI. I feel like we've been just waiting to be reassured that Carlton had PFI and they did that on Thursday night. Is it the best coach game of the year? So what are you trying to do? You're trying to take away the threats of the opposition. So they say, okay, well, Butters is going to get some ball, but we're going to put Chinkotta to him. We're not, going to, we're not going to use our prime movers in the middle. We're going to use – we'll see if Chinkotta can do it. He's, he's done a little bit of this over the last few weeks. Let's see if he can go in there and do it. So Butters has 24 disposals, not a bad number, but not a big number, and only five score involvements. Huge tick. Huge tick. One of the best players in the competition held to that. There's no Connor Rosie there, so so okay. There's there's no next level player that can can cover that. So really, it's Horn Francis versus our midfield. Now he was a he was a good, very good player in patches of that game, but we know he's we know he's gettable. We know that he's ripped hair and bust, and we'll be able to have some fun the other way. So let's try and keep an eye on him at stoppage, but we're comfortable with him get, going head to head with Cripps and Walsh and these guys in the middle. We're more than happy with that because he will get it wrong at times, and we've got to make him pay. Now, it took a while for that to happen, but it happened. And then we're also going <clears> to <throat> we're going to make sure as a team, this is a team buy-in, so forwards, hey, they split the, the, the uncontested marker who, who takes the ball in the middle of the ground. They have a left footer running one side for the handball receive and the right footer running to the other side. So they will split that player every time. Houston one way, Farrell the other. And more often than not, you've got one, def- one forward playing the defensive role there and you can't go with both. So they get the they get the pure handball past the man on the mark at speed into those forwards who want it coming quickly because let's be honest they're not good enough if it doesn't. Dixon had a poor night so they were made, they were made to look um, wanting they were wanting for another forward. Joe uh, Jardy's kicked goals but they wanted they really desperately needed Marshall to be the man or someone else down there to stand up. So I thought Vossi disarmed them really well. And, and then when the game become a, a Carlton game at stoppage in the last quarter, we haven't seen a quarter like it. That first, the first five or six goals of that quarter, I think I looked at the clock and there was still 17 minutes or 15 it minutes to go. how quickly it happened. <laughs> it threatened to be a 40-minute quarter for a while there, but it was just amazing. And I think that's going to be Carlton. I, I, I just think they're going to get um, talent back. The, the 23 is going to get better, but they've set standards um, over the last few weeks. And we, we lived this last year, so we shouldn't be shocked by this. Yeah, they've been severely impacted by injury, but I just think if, you, if you're looking to endorse the coach, then that's it. I, I think Pitnett will play. Everyone's jumped off Mark Pitnett because they see what De Koning can do. And when he wasn't in the ruck, it was a problem in the first half. It was a problem. They had Kennedy in the ruck at times against Soldo, no good, and they got a, they got a goal scoring opportunity from it. Port Adelaide. Um, they had Cripps in the ruck at times. They had Harry who didn't have his best night in the ruck. I just want to leave Harry forward, and I know there's an opportunity to throw him. But you can always do that. You can always sub the ruckman out of the game. That's the beauty of the sub because Mark Pittnett is the best centre bounce ruckman in the competition in terms of creating scores uh, for. Yeah. His, his last six games, when he's in at centre bounces, they're plus 25 centre bounce clearances. That's the best return um, of any player in the competition. So don't give up on an asset. No, no. So on preliminary final night, PFI, is Pitnett and Stacconi in your team? Yeah, with the, with the ability to sub Pitnett out halfway through the third quarter. Because we, if he's going really well, we keep going with it. But I'm happy to have him on the bench for long periods too. Hey, Tom, this is your this is your ruck role to 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 maximise. Go your hardest the first twelve minutes, and Mark, you can sit there for a bit. And if it's going beautifully, we roll on. And then you go the, into your second ruck. He only has to go on for six or seven minutes. But if he can if he can keep the energy up with this clearance game, that's where they're going to win it, Jared. So why wouldn't you maximise that rather than have another runner? Sunday night, Carlton and Essendon. Do you want to put parameters around your seedings today? We only vaguely understand them ourselves. That's right. I'm playing this week as if you gave me $400, which we know is not going to happen because <laughs> you don't give me anything. For, if I, and I had to have four $100 bets to win, who on who was going to win the premiership this okay. year is how I'm attacking it. All right. I'm much more hostage to the moment. Mm. Okay. Who's at four? Collingwood are at four because I'm getting a good price on Collingwood right now. And I'm a value type shopper, Jared. And when they get their numbers back, and they may be out of the eight when they return, 
but they will come with a run at some stage. I'm going to put Bulldogs, Hawthorne, mm. Fremantle. I'll put Fremantle at Fremantle. four. Fremantle. Yep, on hostage wow. to the moment. Like Three? It. Are the Giants? Uh, I still think the Giants have uh, – the buy coming a good time for them. They get a chance to recalibrate. They, they haven't been themselves. Uh, their stars are, are just get, w- getting warm. And they go, they're a good price, Jared. Again, I'm shopping for a little bit of value here. I've got Essendon at three. Carlton and Essendon have flipped positions for me ahead of Sunday night. Two? The Blue Baggers. And they, they are genuine. They are real. And in a very winnable year. They may have just come good at the right time. Yeah, oversubscribed on Carlton and happy to be so there at two and the one seed stayed in the stable. It was like the Caulfield Cup favourite who didn't race while everything else drifted. <laughs> I might have a Quinella actually, now that you say that. Sydney Swans at one. All right, those are the seedings. Take them as you will. Do now, your own uh, if you don't a, like them. Just one last question for you as we wind it up. Is it a good week to play Collingwood or is it a good week to play Melbourne? I think it's a bad week to play Melbourne. A bad Can week? Can I answer it that way? No. They'll no. surely respond. Why do you rewrite my question? <laughs> so it's, yes, yeah, so I, I don't understand the premise of your question, David.